Good morning, Facebook Live. This is Robin Kirby Gatto. Welcome to January the 3rd. We are starting a fast, and so this morning's broadcast, I'm going to mention just a few things. I'm going to mention about a fast. I'm going to mention about no more delay, and I'm going to mention about divination. All three of those things, so this will be a lengthy Walking with Wisdom broadcast, and I pray that it blesses you. As we enter into this broadcast, I just pray that the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Donna, God bless you. I'm going to swipe the comments off. So let's get started. We're looking at a fast, and someone asked me on Facebook, what is a fast? I'm going to emphasize Isaiah 58 and get into those scriptures. And so fasting, as it relates where scripture unfolds, is a humbling of the soul. We're no longer feeding the appetites of the flesh, but we're feeding our spirit man. And our focus is on the Father. Now, I do not recommend different fasts because of liability issues. I do have a law degree as well as health and wellness certification and master's and master's in social work. And so I know enough not to recommend certain fasts other than telling you to go to your physician, especially if you have a medical condition. <clears throat> and you know, you don't have to just fast food. You can fast certain foods. That is not my persuasion about what to tell you to do. But a fast is withdrawing from things that are feeding the appetites of this flesh nature, and it's just a humbling of the soul. I want to read Isaiah 58, and we see that when the Lord was on earth, that John's disciples, they fasted, and they were having issue because Jesus' disciples weren't fasting, and Jesus' disciple, Jesus stated that it was because the bridegroom was present that the disciples did not need to fast when Jesus Christ himself was there. And so I want to read to you Isaiah 58. When we fast, Jesus Christ, who is eternal life in us, again, it is like putting wood on that fire. As I've been giving you the analogy that you have one of two fires that you're feeding at every any moment. The first one is eternal life. That is what we want to feed. That is the life, John 1, 4, and 5, that is the light in us, in the fire, the fire burning in us. And so we feed that fire. One of the ways is by humbling ourselves and choosing to focus more on our spiritual life and not just feeding the flesh and the appetites of the flesh. And so, again, it could be skipping a meal. It could be not eating sugars, not eating breads. A lot of people love to do the Daniel fast. And it could be a water fast. I totally recommend do not do a water fast unless you are under medical supervision. It can be very dangerous. And a lot of people don't understand. It can be very dangerous. And you don't want to get in trouble with your body. Amen. A fast is supposed to be easy. It is not supposed to be difficult. There is a supernatural grace supplied where there is joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so I want to read one of my favorite scriptures about a fast is to read Isaiah 58. And I'm going to read scriptures that starting in verse 1. I'm going to start in verse 1 and read verse 1, Isaiah 58, the Amplified Classic. Scripture says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Now, the core scripture that I posted yesterday leading up to this fast, which for me, I'm doing today through the 22nd. Those that want to join, please join because there is a grace in a corporate fast. What is a corporate fast where God is calling the body? a group, his church, together, together, and to fast because there is greater grace, there's greater power distributed by the Holy Spirit. When we're coming together, two and three are agreeing in faith in a fast. And so Second Chronicles seven fourteen through 16 is the scripture that I posted 
which is the main scripture for the fast. I'll read that before we get to Isaiah 58. And again, we have a lot to cover today. So please watch this video again, okay? So 2 Chronicles 7, 14 through 16, scripture says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek, crave, require necessity, my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is offered in this place. For I've chosen and sanctified, I've set apart for holy use this house, that my name may be here forever, and my eyes and my heart will be here perpetually. And so this fast is a humbling of ourselves. We're not seeing the sins of other people. We're seeing our own sins, the log in our eye, and we're humbling ourselves so God can show us areas in which our heart has been deceitful and we can repent as Holy Spirit shows us the areas of sin nature, error that we have walked in and been blind to or that we've given our members over to willingly. This is a time to really see the anointing destroy the yoke of oppression that is on your members. And in this place, it is just like an amplification of the Spirit of the Lord and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord coming together with the Spirit of God's might, strengthening us in prayer that as we draw close to God, that we see His eye through His eyes and have His heart, others, and we pray for their freedom. And we pray for their breakthrough. We're not seeing the negative in other people. We're seeing the God potential, the God freedom in other people. Amen. And so I want to read Isaiah 58 verses 1 through 8. This is for this particular fast. And then I'm going to get to delay and divination. We have a lot to cover. It's going to be amazing. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. And declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek, inquire for, and require me daily and delight externally to know my ways. As if they were in reality a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God in visible ways. Why have we fasted, they say, and you do not see it? Why have we afflicted ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, O Israel, on the day of your fast, when you should be grieving of your sins, you find profit in your business. And instead of stopping all work that the law implies and your workmen should do, you exhort from your hired servants a full amount of labor. So let's apply this to us individually. You might be working and you know that is what you're having to do to provide income. And so the emphasis that is applying to you in this fast as it relates to this particular scripture is that you stop from the works of profiting in your own strength. You only do what the Father tells you to do and what the Father shows you to do. You're not doing things in your own strength. Let's go to verse four. The facts are that you fast only for strife. We don't want strife. If you're in this fast, and if there is strife, you are not in the Lord's fast. You're in your own fast, and it's in your own strength. If you find yourself in strife, repent. Pursue Christ and His love. Read 1 John 1 through chapter 4, and go into that love of Christ Jesus to know God's love, and to love the church, to love others. Amen. Verse 4 again, the facts are that you fast only for strife and debate. In this fast, we do not want to enter any, any debate. It is not pointing out other people's faults. It is seeking God for mercy for our own soul in order that we come into this understanding of the conviction of Holy Spirit, 
where we need to repent, and that is the changing of the mind and of the will that were pricked by the Holy Spirit, and we enter into the place of the Father's will. Amen. The facts are that you fast only for strife and debate and to smite with a fist of wickedness. Fasting as you do today will not cause your voice to be heard on high. Is such a fast as yours what I have chosen? A day for a man to humble himself. Now, this is a true fast that we're seeing. There's a distinction where the prophet Jeremiah is proclaiming to Israel, listen, you're fasting, but your fasting is full of strife. It's full of debate, and it is about vanity. It is not true humility. And so now we're seeing God unpack what a true fast looks like. If you're only fasting a certain food and you have this ungodly attitude, it is not a true fast. It is just a weight loss program. We don't want a weight loss program. It is not about weight loss. It is about humility. And I plead with churches do not emphasize weight loss because then you take that people off the eyes of Christ Jesus and putting their eyes on him and glorifying the father. It is not about weight loss. It is about a spiritual growth, growing strong in spirit. Luke 180, John the Baptist grew strong in spirit. Luke 240, Jesus grew strong in spirit. That's what this is about. Amen. Verse five is such a fast as yours. What I've chosen a day for a man to humble himself with sorrow in his soul. Is true fasting merely mechanical? Is it only to bow down the head like a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him to indicate a condition of heart that he does not have? That he does not have? Will you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? So again, we're about to see what a true fast is, where God is saying, listen, you are in a mechanical process. It is not a true humility. It is a false humility, which false humility is, guess what? Pride. And you're just prideful about your fasting. True humility is about, God, please show me my heart. Where have I offended you, Lord? Where have I looked at others? Unlovely God, where have I exalted myself and put others down, God? Please forgive me, Father. God, where is it? Who is it that I need to pray for? There's going to be an increased hunger and thirst of righteousness for prayer in this fast. Like crazy. Amen. Verse 6. Rather, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the bands of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every enslaving yoke. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless into your house when you see the naked, that you cover him and that you hide not yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood? There is an amplification like a magnifying glass of seeing others through the eyes of the Lord in a fast. That's what verse six is about. Is it not uh, in verse seven, verse eight? Then shall your light break forth. Now, this is what's supposed to happen in a fast. There's going to be a yoke-destroying anointing. And the light is eternal life, Jesus in us. That light is amplified in the fast because we're putting wood on the fire of eternal life, not on the fire of Gehenna, James 3, where we're in strife and debate. If you're in strife and debate... You're putting wood on the wrong fire and you need to humble yourselves and do a heart check. God, I am so sorry, Father. I am so sorry for having a striving heart against others and a proud heart against others. Father, please, Father, forgive me for how I've seen others. Please humble me, God, and cause me to see myself and where I need to repent. Verse 8. Then shall your light break forth like the morning and your healing and your restoration and the power of a new life shall spring forth speedily. This is, again, eternal life. 
It is a fresh anointing, a new anointing. That's, that's eternal life is Jesus in us. That is revival. Revival is to take place every single day in our lives, in our bodies, because we're feeding that eternal life in our members. Amen. Then shall your light break forth like the morning and your healing, your restoration and the power of a new life shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness, rightness, justice, and right relationship with God shall go before you, conducting, conducting you to peace and prosperity, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Now, I'm going to do verse 9, and then we're going to go to Jeremiah 33, 3. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from your midst the yoke of oppression, wherever you find them, the finger pointed in scorn toward the oppressed or the godly, and every form of false, harsh, unjust, and wicked speaking. And if you pour out that with which you sustain your own life for the hungry and satisfy the need of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in darkness and your obscurity and gloom become like the noonday. Woo! And the Lord shall guide you continually and satisfy you in drought and dry places and make you your strong, your bones. And you shall be like a water garden, like a spring of a water whose waters do not fail. Woo! The wind is blowing. The door is shutting. Hallelujah. It's opening. The wind is blowing it. It's opening it. And then it's shutting. Today it's going to shut on delay and divination. And it's going to open to calling out to God and Him answering you. Amen. And so let's look at Jeremiah 33 3 next. And then I'm going to get into divination and delay. Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me. Let's start from verse 1. We just have to start from verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time, while he was still shut up in the court of the guard, saying, so the door was closed. Watch this. Thus says the Lord, who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Woo! Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things fenced in and hidden, which you do not know. Do not distinguish, recognize, have knowledge of, and understand. So in this fast, you're going to have a call to God. I'll never forget when God told me over a decade ago, was I, when I was getting ready for another book to be published, God said, Robin, I want you to call Princess Warrior's book publication in. I said, whoo, how does that look like, God? He said, just call it. And I said, glory to God, because I had been praying to the Father about other things. I had not been praying to him about the publication of Princess Warrior's, but God spoke to me with an urgency. And he said, Robin, you call it in. So I said, glory to God. Hallelujah. God, I just call that book in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And do you know, God moved heaven and earth with the abundance of favor that only God could do because in the natural, that book should not have been published. I cannot even explain how much favor God gave me to move heaven and earth to get that book published. And I just called it out as God said, call it out. And there is power in calling unto God. And when he puts a call on your life and tells you to call something in, to do it, to be obedient. And generally in a fast that is present, where there is a call that you're calling out unto God and he has you call something in. And that is prayer. That is declaration. Amen. And as soon as I prayed it and declared it and called it, woo, it happened as the Lord had instructed me. Just like he's instructing Jeremiah, call to me, Jeremiah. I'll answer you. 
Stop complaining. Stop putting your eyes on the natural circumstances. Call to me. There is something that is more extravagant and powerful that you don't see in the supernatural. That's what God is saying. Call to him. Amen. So this word call in Hebrew is called all. Called all. And it means to call. It means to invite. It means to mention. It means to pronounce. To publish. It means to cry. It means renowned. Read. Preach. Proclaim. Proclamation. It means say. This is identical with the other Hebrew word, which sounds very similar. And it, that particular word, karal, means, it means to come, to fall upon, to encounter, and to meet. And so the three Hebrew letters we see are kuf, olive, and resh. Kuf, resh, and olive. Kuf, resh, and olive. Kuf is the ancient symbol of the back of a head or a sun on the horizon. Last, follow behind, or rising. And resh is the ancient symbol of a man's face. It means head highest person. And all leaf is an ox. And it means strength beginning and first. And so the word picture for call, are you ready? Is the rising up of the most high strength that is from the beginning. It's from eternity. Do you hear this, saints of God? The rising up of the most high strength from eternity. Now, why is this so important? Let me get into delay and divination. Well, over this past weekend, there was just a massive attack, and God was giving me dreams in the last week uh, and uh, exposing divination. And it was an all out attack, and it was meant to come against your hearing as well as to make you feel like there was blood stains on your garments, that there was impurity on your garments, and it was trying to bring condemnation and fear. And so let's look at Acts 16, 16, and understand 16 means marriage covenant, and I can't get into the explanation of all that right yet, but other than to say that it's eight plus eight. When the priest cleaned the temple, for eight days, they cleaned the porch, and for eight days, they cleaned the inner court. And when we see Jesus, he came to the synagogue on the eighth day for his circumcision. When we see the Feast of Tabernacles, the eighth day is a holy assembly. So eight and eight equals marriage covenant. It is us married to the bridegroom. Amen. So Acts 16, 16, this is to come after your identity of who you think you are is to make you feel like God's delaying things. It is to bring division. It is to make you question your call. Now, you can't see this all with the scriptures right here, but I'm telling you as a person who's experienced this and the symptoms as well as are going to be that it's going to make you paranoid and it's going to make you feel bad. This is not coming from a person at this moment. It is attacking the whole body of Christ Jesus, the remnant, okay? And it's going to, if you're not careful, make you paranoid with other people. Make this person paranoid with this person, this person paranoid with this person. And you're going to have interactions of speaking with each other that are miscommunications and mistranslations, okay? And we don't want that, amen? And so you really have to guard your heart and enter this fast. And it's going to make you feel like there is a delay where that delay tries to defer hope. And we don't want that, okay? So let's look at Acts 16, 16, where Paul is dealing with this spirit of divination. As we were on our way to the place of prayer. And so in this time of fasting, the emphasis is prayer, Okay, there's 16 people on. That's so funny. Uh, it's about prayer. We're going deeper in prayer. We're crying to God. We're seeing our condition. We're humbling ourselves. He's answering us. Amen. 
And so, as we were on our way to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who was possessed by a spirit of divination, claiming to foretell future events and discover hidden knowledge, and she brought her owners much gain by her fortune-telling. She kept following Paul and the rest of us shouting loudly, These are the men, the servants of the Most High God, They announced to you the way of salvation, and she did this for many days. Then Paul, being sorely annoyed, ding, 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 ding. Have you been agitated? (laughs) Have you been annoyed and worn out? Annoyed and worn out, turned and said to the spirit within her, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that moment. We're going to look at this, and we're going to look at a Greek word about annoyed, okay? And we're going to look at that word and get some understanding. And so, that spirit, I've done several videos on this spirit of divination. It has attracted our ministry on different ends through different times, and Holy Spirit has revealed this spirit to such capacity that it wants to manipulate you through something that seems spiritual and of God, but it's not. And the intent of the enemy is to bring division. It's divination. It wants to divide. It wants to pit people against each other, put them on odds, and to pit them against each other to make them paranoid. And it, it it's just, it is like... Post-traumatic stress disorder on steroids. I I kid you not. Post-traumatic stress disorder on steroids. Because some of the, and I'll have a whole chapter on post-traumatic stress disorder in the book, uh, The Forbidden Fruit, The Spiritual Disease, which is all about eternal life. And so some of the symptoms are hypervigilance and paranoia for post-traumatic stress disorder. That is what divination is about. And so Paul the Apostle is walking. He's ministering. He's preaching. He's bringing the God news. And this spirit looks very spiritual. And it's saying, these are the men, the servants of the Most High God. So it looks spiritual. Okay? It's not going to come under the guise of something that's anti-Christ, anti-God. It is going to be cloaked. It's going to look like it could be God. But look at the fruit. There's divisiveness. There's stress. There's fear. There's contention. There's strife. There's everything in Isaiah 58, verses 1 through, well, starting verses 3 through 5, that the Lord has told us. It's, oh, thank you, Carol. I'm so glad. Oh, I love that book, The House of Prayer. God's Firewall, The House of Prayer. That's an awesome book. One of my favorite books. And so, and that's on Amazon. Thank you, Carol. And so, it is like post-traumatic stress disorder on steroids, okay? Divination is divisive, paranoia, hypervigilance. Everybody is like on this hyper-steroid, like, oh my gosh, I got to protect myself. I got to protect myself. I got to protect myself. It is just like off the chain. And on top of that, add delay. Now, excuse me, can we have like a worse recipe of a spiritual attack, division, divination, and delay? Oh my goodness, we have to press in this hour, and we have to resist the devil and watch him flee, and we do it by humbling ourselves and seeing others through the heart of the Father, through the eyes of God, and loving others, and that squishes and defeats paranoia. It squishes and defeats divination and delay. Do you understand this? And so Paul, in Acts 16, it says Paul was very annoyed. Paul was very, very annoyed. And so in the King James Version, it says being grieved. And so this word being grieved is diop. Onio, diop, onio. Oh yeah, we're going diop. We're going deep. Psalm 42, 7, we're roaring deep, cries to roaring deep. At the breaking forth of God's water spouts, we're going diop, onio. We're going diop, 
on our knees. Oh, what? We're going deep on the knees. Prayer. Diop o neo. Is that not amazing? When you get annoyed with divination, you go deep on your knees in prayer and you call to God and he breaks it off of you. Amen. And so diop o neo is a derivative of, to- of, of another Greek word, which we're going to get into. And it means to be worried. It means to be grieved. And this also comes from the Greek word dia. And dia means through. It means on occasion of, it means thereby, therefore, it means to avoid, it means to be among, and it means always. In other words, this stuff is among me, and it, it, it is coming against me, so, oh God, take me deep on my knees in prayer to break this thing off of me and others in Jesus' name. You're not coming against me, my family. You're not coming against those that I love. You're not coming against people. You're not coming against making me think poorly of others. No, 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 no. I am going to see through God's eyes how he sees others. And I'm going to pray for their freedom. Amen. I'm not going to see their behavior coming at me that the enemy would make me think or that's actually happening. I'm going deep on my knees and I'm going to call to God. He's going to answer me. And I'm going to see the power of Holy Spirit cast this thing out in Jesus' name. So we have covered a lot. That's what's going on right now. In this fast, humbling ourselves. Make sure you get medical supervision uh, when necessary. Make sure you get a fast uh, uh, confirmed and uh, okayed by your doctor, especially if you have a medical condition. And in this place, Watch God break delay. There's no delay on your life. It is only a false reality by the spirit of divination that's making you paranoid and thinking that something is wrong with you and that you're bad. That is a lying spirit. And that's exactly what was attacking Paul. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you what. Ministers feel that. The devil wants to stop the message. So he tries to make the minister feel bad. And make the minister feel like they have no strength, no power of the Holy Spirit within their members to come against this attack of the enemy. And that something is wrong with them. It tries to bring condemnation. Pray for ministers. I cannot emphasize how much they are in need of prayer. Amen. And pray for one another. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Pray for one another. Amen. So, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray the spirit of the Lord is upon you. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I pray God's grace for his fast for your life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray he stir your members up and he brings a strength from on high of his might in your inner man, rooting you deeply in the love of Jesus and causing you to know a love of God that abounds at a greater height, depth, and width as you get deep on your knees. Hallelujah. And you see the enemy's attacks defeated against you, your family, those you love, and others that God puts in your life as the delay that's been on your life, as hope has been deferred. It is broken in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's hope does not disappoint as you are in the stronghold of his hope. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you, Roseanne.